are the conditions that would justify a tall building's demolition rather than renovation? That's relatively difficult to say. Okay, on the one hand side, if we do the renovation, then the outcome has to perfectly fit into the surrounding urban context, the surrounding architecture, and it has, of course, to fulfill all the function it needs to fulfill in a perfect way. If we wrap away the buildings, skin, all the interiors, etc., and have the sheer primary structure in front of us, the question is, how much energy does it take to bring it down? And how much embodied energy do we need to erect another one which fits future aspects and requirements in a better way? So the aspect of embodied energy in combination with the aspect of the careful treatment of the materials we use to build is something which is very important in my work during the last 10 to 15 years. And uh, this is something I think we should a little bit more focus on. See, if you, for example, if we talk about embodied energy, if you take a simple residential building in Central Europe, the embodied energy means all the energy which goes into the materials, the components, into the erection before we, for the first time, move into the building is for a regular residential building about 25 to 35 times the annual energy consumption. So it does not make any sense to optimize the annual consumption by another 2 to 5 to 10 percent with huge efforts. We have to look also on this what I call the begin of life phase where we already stuff that embodied energy into the building and we have to optimize that. This raises a couple of very interesting questions. For example, which building material is the right one, which has lesser embodied energy compared to its ability to do something like transfer a force or reduce a deformation, things like this. And this then really turns the world upwards down. If we talk about lightweight, means reduce the consumption of resources, and we have a very simple problem like a vertical column which transfers a force over a certain length. And we would compare steel and concrete. It is quite obvious that a steel column is four to five times lighter. So we save resources, which is wonderful. If we ask the question, is it a steel or a concrete column which contains lesser embodied energy, then the concrete column would win by factor 10. So for the scientists, this is now a diverging optimization problem. Yeah, we use less resources with steel, we use less res uh, embodied energy with concrete. If you would talk about concrete slabs, cores, etc., the problem would become even more complicated. And uh, sadly enough, the worldwide research did not focus on that point during the last decades. Not at all. It was just forgotten. Yeah. So we dig that out, uh, because I think in the entire sustainability discussion, which has also been widened up to other aspects than just ecology and economy, we have to focus on the entire life cycle of a building, not only to the phase of operation. We have to look at this begin of life as well as onto the end of life phase, what happens with the materials after we tear the building down, wherever we need to do that? Is this recyclable or does it just go all to the waste dump? We have to be aware of the fact that mass waste production in this world comes to 60% from the building industry. This is a responsibility we have. And the turnover we do, we are responsible for, is will explode within the next 10 to 15 years in a never seen before dimension. See, if we look a little bit on this very trivial, very well known curve on how the population on the planet develops over the last three decades and the next two to three, we call it explosion. Okay, what does it mean? It means that nowadays about two billion people on this planet are younger than 18. Two billion people are still living with their parents. 
within the next 18 years, obviously, they want to move out. They want to have an apartment, at least a tiny one, but they want to have something. They need a working place, they need the infrastructure, etc. So if we now look back on the human being's history, when were two billion people on the planet? This was around 1930. So it means the entire world, as it was out there in 1930, with all the bridges, tunnels, dams, buildings, everything, has to be built once more in the upcoming 18 years. Plus, we have to take into account that at those times, many, many people didn't even have a toilet. So if we want to come up with nowadays standards, it's probably 1.2, 1.5 times the world which was there in 1930. This means, if you look at the sheer tonnages we have to <laughs> work with, yeah? if we look at the kilowatt hours we have to deal with, if we look on the waste production, it seems to be a problem difficult, very difficult to be handled. But if we want to avoid heavy social problems, migrations, wars, and all those things, we have to somehow at least to try to solve that. You mentioned uh, the three pillars of sustainability, which is ecology, <clears throat> economy, and the third one that uh, you tell me, if engineers think about sociocultural yeah. a lot, but at least, at least you are. Um, and you speak of, uh, of something called sufficiency. Yeah. How much is enough? What, what is that and how does that fit into your yeah. thinking? Okay. See, once, when we started to talk about sustainability, which was something I was brought up with without using the term, it was just the to-dos and not to-dos in the countryside. The rules and regulars which had been developed over generations don't produce waste, don't throw that away, use it twice or whatever, all those things carefulness, adequacy of the human behavior in his surrounding. Many of those rules have been forgotten after the World War II in many regions worldwide. So the term sufficiency, which uh, the term sustainability, which comes from the forest, from the wood management, in, uh, it was one of the chief deputies of the King August der Starke in Saxony who developed that. We all focused on ecological aspects. Okay, people were right to add the economical aspect to it too, but what we forgot in the first years was that we do that for human beings. They should feel fine in their houses, and we should discuss whether a totally airtight zero energy house is really something people want to live in. And we should discuss the fact that people more and more, especially in Central Europe, want to be part of decisions which shape their environment, which shape their city. So we call that participation in all those things. It becomes more and more important. So just do not drop a building designed by a very famous architect, engineered by a very conscious engineer, conscious about sustainability aspects, but also talk to the people, somehow embed them in the entire process. This is a part of this social a column or pillar of sustainability. Then there are other parts like the integration of art, the integration of different generations, the integration of handicapped people, the integration of people with another, let's say, with a, what we call a migration background. This is overcoming the situation that you have a city like, for example, New York. I'm not a New York basher, but the, where you have Chinatown, <laughs> And where even the top people in the city have to urge those people to write a little bit on what they are really doing there in uh, American language and not only just use the Chinese one. We were facing the same situation in central Germany after the so-called Wirtschaftswunder, when many Italians, then Turkish people, came to Germany. And uh, we said we have to integrate them. This must be a part of our society with a migration background, but it must be a part. So we cannot allow them to 
build their own suburbs or parcels within the city. We have to integrate them, like it is in a, such a wonderful way done in Singapore, for example, into our society. This overcomes crime, which is very important and has been done very successful, especially in the southern part of Germany. It brings cultural richness to the inhabitants already there, etc., etc. But doing all those things very correct, carefully, successfully. We must see one thing. It does not make sense to, for example, if we talk about energy consumption, to reduce the energy consumption per square meter of office over the years, per square meter of whatever living room over the years, as it happened in Germany. In Germany, heating energy Consumption was reduced in the last 40 years in residential buildings by 40%. Big success. Political success. Never happened in any other part of the world. But the increase in the size of the apartments and the houses was 50%. So per square meter, there were big savings. Per capita, zero. So the question, and this has been raised by the Swiss people is don't talk about square meters, don't talk about apartment, talk about the person, talk about per capita. What is adequate? What can we allow a single human being to use, to exhaust, <laughs> to waste, and so ever? And uh, interestingly enough, already a couple of years ago, the people from Zurich, Switzerland, they voted with a big majority for the introduction of the 2000 watt society, which means that they are willing to limit their energy consumption per capita to 2000 watt. Together with that, it comes along that they decided to reduce their CO2 emission per year down to one ton per capita. So one ton per capita and year to be achieved in around 2050 means that even with a relatively tiny car, a German smart car, you can just run 10,000 kilometers or 6,000 miles, and this is the ton then. If you want to import meat, import fruits, whatever, this is already exceeding the ton. Means this will either dramatically change our life or we just forget about that goal. But if we do so, then we will, and this is very, very clear, run into a global warming problem of, with causing effects never seen before. So this is something where the society has to dramatically reconstitute its behavior, which is difficult enough. And parallel to that, the society is rapidly, explosive-wise growing. And those two effects, at the same time, this is the complexity we are dealing with. But without the term sufficiency of what is adequate to the single one, we won't succeed. Definitely not. I'm researching those things now since 20 years. And from a very optimistic standpoint, maybe, maybe it was the standpoint of the young researcher to a very skeptical standpoint of the now 60-year-old professor I'm not happy about the situation I'm in, but I went through all those topics for many years with many brilliant assistants, and this is what we think where we stand, and this is what we think what we have to do.